Hello friends, I am Dr. Khalil and in this video, we will talk about the latest INICT radiology recall questions. The purpose of the video will be to get you familiar with the questions asked in radiology as well as try to get you know oriented to the topics that were tested. So let's get started. Now looking at the first question here, which of the following investigation can be used in osteoporosis? DEXA scan, quantitative CT scan, bone scan or serum chemical analysis among the options given which all investigations can we do in a patient of osteoporosis. Please remember the gold standard investigation to look at bone mineral density in patients when we are evaluating for osteoporosis is your DEXA scan, the dual energy X-ray absorptiometry. The dual energy X-ray absorptiometry is the gold standard investigation. This is the gold standard. Quantitative CT is also an additional investigation that we would like to do in patients especially when we are trying to evaluate the trabecular bone. So quantitative CT scan can evaluate trabecular bone better and separately from the cortical bone evaluates the trabecular bone separately. So this can also be used and it's a you know, new technique which is also effectively being used in the analysis of bone mineral density. Serum biochemical analysis is also routinely done in the evaluation of patients with osteoporosis. Please remember in osteoporosis the serum alkaline phosphatase levels, the serum calcium levels, the serum phosphate levels are normal. But still we need to get the serum biochemical analysis done to rule out other causes for decreased bone mineral density like hyperparathyroidism. So that is the reason you need to get serum biochemical analysis, the serum alkaline phosphatase, serum calcium and phosphate levels also done. So basically all these three tests can be done but there is no role of bone scan in the evaluation of patients with osteoporosis. So the correct answer here will be 1, 2 and 4. So let's understand these techniques better. So this is how you have your DEXA scan which is basically used to measure the bone mineral density. The patient lies down and we check for the you know bone mineral density on the lumbar spine on the hip region where we use this central DEXA machines to look at the bone mineral density involving the spine and the hip. So please remember dual energy x-ray absorptiometry is a non-invasive, highly accurate, reliable and a low radiation technique to detect bone mineral density. So it is a gold standard for diagnosis of you know bone mineral density in patients with osteoporosis. Now, what are all the indications for getting a DEXA scan to detect bone mineral density? Please remember, all women who are 65 years and above should undergo DEXA scan to look for their bone mineral density. So all women who are 65 years and above should undergo bone mineral density testing. And all men who are 70 years and above should undergo bone mineral density testing. So these ages are important. Females above 65 years and males above 70 years should undergo DEXA scan for their bone mineral density testing. And adults who are less than 65 years can also undergo DEXA scan if they have any fragility fracture, if they have any diseases which can cause you know low bone density like a hyperparathyroidism. And you should advise DEXA scan in persons who are on medications which can cause low bone density. So if there are any adults who are on medication associated with low bone density like your steroids, long term therapy of steroids, we all know can cause you know decreased bone mineral density. So in such patients who are on long term steroids, you can advise a DEXA scan even if they are less than 65 years. And also anyone who is being treated for low bone density to monitor response to therapy and Anybody who is not receiving therapy but whom the evidence of bone loss would lead to treatment should also undergo you know DEXA scan. So if you feel that if there is any bone loss you may start treatment then also you should advise a DEXA scan in such patients. And any woman who has discontinued osteoporosis you should get DEXA scan to know the present status of the patient. So these are the all different indications that are there for you know getting a DEXA scan done. Remember DEXA scan should be advised in all women who are 65 years and above all men who are 70 years and above in patients who are having you know conditions which can cause decreased bone mineral density like hyperparathyroidism anybody who is having fragility fractures any person who is on long term steroid therapy or many other medications which can cause low bone density right and to also to monitor response to therapy so these are some important indications that you should remember so dexa scan that is dual energy x-ray absorptiometry is a standard reference for diagnosis of osteoporosis it also used to assess the risk of fractures, to look for the risk of developing spinal fractures, the vertebral fractures, we get a spine DEXA done. To look for the risk of developing fracture neck of femur, we get okay DEXA of the hip region. And 
it is also useful in monitoring response to treatment once you start them on you know the bisphosphonates and other treatment for osteoporosis to look at their response to treatment also dexa scan is used now let's try to understand the technique of dexa scan dexa as the name says is a dual energy x-ray absorptiometry so two different type of x-ray energies dual energies are used and we look at their absorptions right so two different type of x-ray energy are used soft tissues absorb one type of energy and the bone based on its mineral content absorb another type of x-ray energy so basically there is an x-ray source from where we get two different type of x-ray energy soft tissues absorbing one type of energy bone based on its mineral content is absorbing another type of x-ray energy and after the x-ray beam passes through the patient it is made to fall on the x-ray detector which is you know then analyzed on a computer you get a 2D image which is then analyzed on the computer. This is how a DEXA scan is done. Now look at these DEXA scan images obtained from two different patients. So you can see here in this, the first patient you can see that the bone mineral density can be obtained from the lumbar spine. You can also evaluate the lean body mass, the muscle mass of the patient. So using DEXA, it is not just for bone mineral density, we can also look for the lean body mass and for the fat content in the patients. Look at this another case. Here you can look for the bone mineral density by looking at the lumbar spine, by looking at the hip and you can also see that this patient has lesser muscle mass and more fat content in the body. So that is how DEXA scan is not just used for bone mineral density testing, it is also used to look at your lean body mass as well as your fat content. And please remember, during DEXA scan we have two types of DEXA machines, central DEXA devices and peripheral DEXA devices. The central DEXA devices are used to measure the bone mineral density from the lumbar spine. So to evaluate the bone mineral density from the lumbar spine or to evaluate the bone mineral density from the hip, from the neck of the femur. If you want to look at the bone mineral density from the hip region and from the lumbar spine, we go for this central DEXA machines. The peripheral DEXA devices are used when we want to look for the bone mineral density from the wrist, from the non-dominant forearm. We use the non-dominant forearm and sometimes we also use the heel or calcaneum the heel or calcaneum can also be used right so especially when central dexa cannot be done if the patient is morbidly obese to go onto the table or if there is patient who already has hyperparathyroidism and you would like to go for you know evaluation of the wrist a peripheral dexa can be advised so in such cases we have peripheral dexa devices which look for the bone mineral density in the wrist region or in the heel or calcaneal region so the different sites that we use to measure the bone mineral density are the same sites that are prone to develop osteoporotic fracture. The preferred site is your lumbar spine, the lumbar spine, right? And the other site is the neck of the femur, the neck of femur or the hip region. So this is evaluated by central dexa. Central dexa is better than peripheral dexa. So peripheral dexa, we do it from the non-dominant forearm non-dominant forearm at the colis area so remember colis is a common fracture that happens in you know osteoporotic patients so even wrist evaluation to look at the you know colis region we go for the non-dominant forearm and even when you have hyperparathyroidism uh, peripheral dexa is advised central dexa is much better to evaluate the bone mineral density than a peripheral dexa Peripheral dexa is advised when central dexa cannot be done or when the patient has some hyperparathyroidism. And among the lumbar spine and the uh, femoral neck, please remember the lumbar spine is the ideal site. The ideal site for looking at bone mineral density is the lumbar spine. Please remember the trabecular bone is a better representative of bone metabolism. And the lumbar spine has more trabecular bone than the neck of the femur. And that is the reason your lumbar spine is a better site to evaluate the response to therapy to evaluate the bone mineral density. So central dexa is preferred over peripheral dexa and the spine dexa is preferred over the hip. And remember to detect the risk of developing vertebral fractures a lumbar spine dexa is preferred. And to detect the risk of developing fracture neck or femur a total hip dexa is preferred where we take the you know the bone mineral density of the both hip and try to get a mean value and to try to assess the risk of developing fracture neck of femur 
And if you're trying to look for in the risk of developing Coley's fracture, we take the peripheral dexa from the non-dominant forearm from the Coley's region. And remember, to look for the risk of developing vertebral fractures, the lumbar spine dexa is preferred. And to look for the risk of developing fracture neck of femur in patients with osteoporosis, we go for a total hip dexa, where bilateral femoral neck region, the bone mill density is tested and a mean value is obtained. So we go for this, you know, total hip dexa, if you're trying to evaluate the risk of developing fracture neck of femur in your osteoporotic patients. So once the dexa scan is done, the values are expressed in terms of standard deviation. And we have two types of scores in DEXA scan, the T-score and the Z-score. In the T-score, the patient's bone mineral density is compared to a healthy young 20 to 30 year old person. So if the patient's bone mineral density is compared to a healthy young 20 to 30 year old, that is called as a T-score. And if you are comparing the patient's bone mineral density to an age and gender matched healthy individual, so if you are comparing a 65 year old person with a healthy 65 year old bone mineral density, that is called as a Z-score. You are comparing with the age and gender matched individual. And WHO recommends T-score for you know the definition of osteoporosis. So WHO prefers to use the T-score. And what is the definition of osteoporosis? Osteoporosis is defined as a T-score which is less than minus 2.5 standard deviation. So a T-score which is less than minus 2.5 standard deviation is called as your osteoporosis. Now imagine you are looking at the T-scores of the individuals and imagine this is a Gaussian curve, a bell-shaped curve where the mean is equal to median is equal to 0. A T-score up till minus 1 standard deviation, this is considered to be normal. Up till minus 1 standard deviation of bone mineral density on a T-score is considered normal. Between minus 1 and minus 2.5 standard deviation, this is osteopenia, osteopenia. And if you have a T-score which is less than minus 2.5 standard deviation, this is osteoporosis, osteoporosis. And if you have a T-score which is less than minus 2.5 standard deviation with any fragility fracture, any fracture is present in the patient, this is considered to be a severe osteoporosis, severe osteoporosis. So the definition of osteopenia is a T-score which is present between a standard deviation of minus 1 to minus 2.5 and osteoporosis is less than minus 2.5 and if you have you know a T-score which is less than minus 2.5 with a fragility fracture it is considered to be a severe osteoporosis. Now let's try to understand what are the limitations of a DEXA scan. Please remember DEXA being a 2D image cannot distinguish the cortical bone from the trabecular bone. So being a 2D image, it cannot differentiate the cortical bone separately from the trabecular bone. Quantitative CT gives you that benefit, but DEXA scan cannot differentiate the trabecular bone. Remember, trabecular bone is a better representative of bone metabolism and DEXA cannot differentiate the trabecular bone separately. And DEXA scan requires proper adequate positioning of the patient. So if you do not have you know, proper positioning of the patient, if there is you know, any rotation in the patient or if there is any scoliosis, DEXA scan values may not be very reliable. And also DEXA scan values are not reliable in the presence of any degenerative sclerotic changes. For example, we have any osteoarthritic changes, any kind of subchondral sclerosis is there or any kind of fracture healing that is happening there, any sclerosis due to the fracture healing is happening or any kind of ankylosing spondylitis is there, the values that are obtained from DEXA are not very reliable in these settings. So these are important limitations of a DEXA scan. Now let's try to understand another important technique that we have to look at the bone mineral density, right, especially of the trabecular bone and that is your quantitative CT scan, quantitative CT scan. The advantage of quantitative CT scan is that it can be used to evaluate both the trabecular and the cortical bone and it can give you the bone mineral density of the trabecular and the cortical bone separately. Please remember the trabecular bone is a better representative of the bone metabolism and the ability to identify the bone mineral density of the trabecular bone makes quantitative CT a very good technique to evaluate the bone mineral density in our patients. And also quantitative CT is also useful in conditions of scoliosis, obesity or spinal degenerative disorders where DEXA scan was not very reliable. So these are important advantages of a quantitative CT. 
And the major disadvantage that we have with quantitative CT is it being a CT scan, it has more radiation dose compared to your low radiation dose technique that is your DEXA scan. DEXA scan is a low radiation dose technique but your quantitative CT has a more radiation exposure. So quantitative CT is actually a very good technique to look at bone mineral density especially of the trabecular bone much better than your DEXA scan in evaluating the bone mineral density especially of the trabecular bone. Just that we don't have enough reference values for it and it has slightly higher radiation dose. The DEXA scan is still considered to be the gold standard but quantitative CT is a very very better technique and a very new technique that can be used to evaluate bone mineral density in our patients. So during a quantitative CT we have a calibration phantom that is used. So this calibration phantom is kept behind the patient while the CT scan is being done. And this calibration phantom consists of crystals of hydroxyapatite of varying bone mineral density. So it has this crystals of calcium hydroxyapatite of varying bone mineral density which are already placed behind the patient while the CT scan is being done. And once the CT is done, you can evaluate a particular portion of the bone separately, just the trabecular bone can be evaluated separately from the outer cortical bone or away from the spinous process and transverse process, just that trabecular bone can be evaluated. And once you obtain the Hounsfield units, it can be converted to bone mineral density units by using the calibration phantom. You can convert these Hounsfield units into bone mineral density units. This is how your quantitative CT using calibration phantom is able to evaluate the bone mineral density in our patients. Now let's look into the next question here. Which area is evaluated along with abdomen during EFAST? Thoracic cavity, pelvic cavity, peripheral blood vessels or subdural and epidural spaces? Please remember along with abdomen during EFAST we also evaluate the thoracic cavity. So the answer should be what? Thoracic cavity. So during FAST we take four standard views. The first view usually is a sub view where we put the ultrasound probe just below the ziphoid process and tilt it upwards to look for any pericardial collection. So basically the sub view is done to evaluate any pericardial collections in the patient and generally this is the first view that is done and uh, the first view usually depends upon the site of injury also. If there is an injury towards the spleen you would go and put the probe there first right but you know if that is not given they just ask you which is the first view to be done the best answer would be your sub view and then the second view that we take is a right upper quadrant or a right lumbar view. We also call it as a right lumbar view or the right upper quadrant view where we put the probe in the right upper quadrant or the right lumbar region and try to evaluate for fluid around the perihepatic area, around the right paracolic gutter or in the Morrison's pouch, the hepatorenal pouch. We try to look for any fluid collections there. And this right upper quadrant view or the right lumbar view is the most sensitive view. This is the most sensitive view for hemoperitoneum. So the most sensitive view to look for hemoperitoneum is your right upper quadrant view. Please remember whenever the patient is lying supine, the most inferior or most dependent portion of the peritoneum is your Morrison's pouch. So any fluid collection would first come into the Morrison's pouch and that is the reason the most sensitive to look at you know hemoperitoneum is your right upper quadrant view. Remember the first view usually is a sub view and the most sensitive to look at hemoperitoneum is a right upper quadrant view or the right lumbar view where we try to evaluate for any fluid collections in the Morrison's pouch. The left upper quadrant view is done to look at the perisplenic area. So the left upper quadrant is basically done to look at any collection in the perisplenic area in the left paracolic gutter. And we also take pelvic views, right? So in a transverse and a longitudinal views, we take at the suprapubic region in the pelvic views to look for any pelvic hematomas, any collections around the bladder or in the pelvis. So these four views will form what is called as your fast. Now coming to E-fast or the extended fast. So E-fast or extended fast in this along with the four traditional fast views that we have like the sub the right lumbar, the left lumbar and the pelvic view where you are evaluating the you know pericardial collections and the hemoperitoneums along with the four traditional fast views. In E-fast we extend the field of view onto the anterior part of the thorax. So you are looking for the right and left thoracic views also and this is to evaluate for any pneumothorax in the patient. So please remember whenever the patient is lying supine and there is pneumothorax the air will ascend upwards anteriorly. So just anterior views are sufficient we don't have to go for lateral views or posterior views. So to evaluate pneumothorax this right and left anterior thoracic views are added and this is what is called as your extended fast or E fast and this is mainly 
to look for pneumothorax in addition to the hemoperitoneum or the pericardial collections in the patient after trauma. Please remember the investigation of choice for pneumothorax is CT scan. But in the emergency room, right to evaluate pneumothorax, extended fast or e-fast is a very good technique, much better than radiographs to evaluate for pneumothorax. Now, let's try to understand some normal lung ultrasound findings before we try to evaluate patients with pneumothorax on ultrasound. So, in a normal lung ultrasound, when we put the probe across the intercostal space like this, these two ribs will form this hyperechoic areas with the posterior acoustic shadowing. So, you will see this hyperechoic area of the rib with its posterior acoustic shadow. And you will also see the pleural line there. So, this white hyperechoic line, this is the pleural line. And this appearance, because of the ribs and the pleural line, this appearance has been called as your bat wing appearance. So, this is bat wing appearance. And bat wing appearance is a normal finding that you see because of the ribs and the pleural white line. So, look at this another normal lung ultrasound image. So, you can see these are the ribs and this is the pleural white line and you can see that bat wing appearance there. And if you observe the pleural white line carefully here, you can see that there is this constant movement occurring because of the lung, the visceral pleura of the lung coming and you know touching the parietal pleura. You can see this constant lung sliding happening. This is the lung sliding that you see. This is the lung sliding which is a normal finding, alright, on a normal ultrasound, you will see this lung sliding happening, where the visceral pleura will be coming and touching the parietal pleura constantly. And you will see lot of this comet tailing and lot of artifacts that you have, which are given different names, the A lines and B lines, we will discuss them in detail. So, during a normal lung ultrasound, just below the pleural white line, you will see this equidistantly present multiple hyperechoic horizontal lines, these are called as your a lines. So, A lines are seen in a normal lung. These are horizontal hyperechoic lines just below the pleural white line giving that you know horizontal reverberation artifacts called as your A lines. And what are B lines that you see on a normal lung ultrasound? Please remember B lines are hyperechoic vertical comet tail like lines that extend from the pleura throughout the screen, right throughout the screen these vertical comet tail like you know hyperechoic lines that are passing through the A lines and which also show movement with the lung sliding, these are called as your B lines. Remember B lines are seen in normal lung, but if you see multiple B lines, if you see multiple B lines which are more than 3 per lung zone, right. So, in each lung zone, if you are seeing multiple confluent B lines more than 3 per lung zone, please think of interstitial edema, it signifies that there is some interstitial edema, ARDS patients or patients of interstitial edema, they can show this confluent multiple B lines. So, B lines is normal, can also be seen in cases of interstitial edema. And another important point that I want you to remember is, you know, B lines normally extend from the pleural white line till the end of the screen. But if you see such hyperechoic vertical lines extending from the skin surface, so, if they extend from the skin surface and run all the way down like this, such type of lines which extend from the skin surface, from the skin if they are extending, such type of lines are called as your E lines. And remember, E lines are not normal. E lines signify that there is some air in the subcutaneous planes and that is seen in what? Subcutaneous emphysema. So, E lines are seen in subcutaneous emphysema. So, please understand A lines and B lines are normal, multiple B lines is suggestive of an interstitial edema and E lines signifies there could be what subcutaneous emphysema. So, look at these normal lung ultrasound findings. So, I hope you can see these horizontal reverberation artifacts that you are seeing which are you know equidistant and you know running horizontally across the lung fields, these are your A lines. And what do you think is these vertical hyperechoic lines which are extending from the pleural line? What are these? These are what? B lines. So, A lines and B lines are seen on a normal lung ultrasound. And when we look at the lungs on a M mode ultrasound, so when we get a M mode ultrasound done, that is the motion mode which is used to evaluate moving structures like the lungs. So, when you evaluate the lungs on a M mode ultrasound, you will see that the lungs which have a constant movement like a constant shimmering which appears like a sand at the seashore. This constant shimmering that appears of the moving lung, remember lung has air inside and air is also hyperechoic on ultrasound. 
So this air inside the lungs, because of its constant shimmering, because of the movements during inspiration and expiration, it appears like the sand at the seashore. The plural white line appears like this hyperechoic line of the you know border of the wave. And the chest wall muscles, right? This will appear like the stagnant sea. So such kind of appearance where the intercostal muscles of the chest they appear like the stagnant sea. The plural white line appears like the bright line at the shore and the shimmering of the lung appears like the sand at the seashore. This has been called as your seashore sign. So seashore sign is seen in case of normal lung. This is a normal lung ultrasound finding seen on an M mode ultrasound. So to sum up what were the normal lung ultrasound findings? On a B mode ultrasound, we saw the batwing appearance of the ribs and the pleura. The lung sliding, which is a constant movement of the lungs, okay, the visceral pleura coming and you know rubbing across the parietal pleura, this constant movement of the lung, this is called as your lung sliding. And the comet tailing or the B lines are the vertical hyperechoic lines extending from the pleural line till the screen. And A lines are these horizontal reverberation artifacts that we see. And on M mode, the important sign that we have on a normal lung ultrasound is called as your seashore sign. Now, look at this CT scan image. In this CT scan image, this is the right side, this is the left side. On the right side, you can see anterior to the right lung, you can see that there is an area of you know air there, free air that is present anterior to the right lung. This which does not have any bronchovascular marking, this area is the area of pneumothorax, right? So this is pneumothorax. So this is the area of the normal lung and anterior to it, you are seeing the area of the pneumothorax. And please remember the investigation of choice to look at small amounts of pneumothorax also. The investigation of choice for air anywhere is a CT scan. So here, the investigation of choice is a CT scan. But imagine if I am doing an ultrasound in this patient to look at pneumothorax. So imagine if I put the probe here and try to evaluate the pneumothorax and if I see that the area of the normal lung will show me all the features of lung sliding, the lung sliding, it will show me the B lines, the comet tail artifacts and it will also show me on an M mode, I will see the seashore sign. So I will see the seashore sign on an M mode ultrasound, right on the M mode ultrasound. But in the area of pneumothorax, I do not have lung there. So here there will be no lung sliding, right. So there will be no lung sliding, there will be absent lung sliding, there will be no B lines or no comet tailing. Right? So, these reverberation artifacts that were there, the vertical uh, comet tail artifacts that were there will not be there. And uh, instead of the vertical B lines, you see lot of horizontal lines of air. Remember air also is hyperechoic on ultrasound. So, even in pneumothorax you have air and this gives hyperechoic lines called as your barcode or your stratosphere sign. And these are all seen on ultrasound. Okay, These are all ultrasound finding. I will show you the images. So, these absent lung sliding, absent B lines and stratosphere sign or barcode sign are ultrasound findings of pneumothorax. And you have this point of transition here. This point of transition between the normal lung sliding and absent lung sliding in between the seashore sign and the absent seashore sign between the B lines and absent B lines. This point of transition that you evaluate on the lung ultrasound is called as your lung point. Let us see them on the lung ultrasound. So I hope you can see this is an ultrasound image and on this ultrasound image you can see this is the area of the lung sliding. You can see there is lung sliding there where the visceral pleura is going and you know rubbing across the parietal pleura and I hope you can see lot of you know vertical comet tailing that you can see that is the B lines and look at this part of the lung here. Here you see absent lung sliding, you do not see any lung sliding, there is absent lung sliding. And here we also do not see any vertical comet tailing, there is absent B lines, there is absent B lines or absent vertical comet tailing. And this point of transition between the lung sliding and absent lung sliding, this is called as a lung point and this is a very specific finding that you see in cases of pneumothorax. So this point of transition between the normal lung sliding and absent lung sliding, this is called as lung point. And if you see lung point, it is suggestive of a pneumothorax. Now look at these ultrasound images from a patient of pneumothorax. So when you see a patient of pneumothorax on ultrasound, on a B mode ultrasound, we see that there is no movement of the lung across the parietal pleura. So you see a appearance called as an absent lung sliding. 
and if you see that area of pneumothorax on a m mode ultrasound on a motion mode ultrasound if you see you will see that the area of the pneumothorax will produce these horizontal hyperechoic lines which resemble like a barcode or a statosphere these are called as your barcode or a statosphere sign barcode or a statosphere sign and these are the important signs that you see in cases of you know pneumothorax you see absent lung sliding you see absent seashore sign instead of seashore sign you see a barcode sign or a statosphere sign on the m mode ultrasound you can see here on a m mode ultrasound the normal lung would show this constant shimmering in the lungs this is called as your seashore sign and in a case of pneumothorax in a case of pneumothorax you see that there is this hyperechoic lines horizontal hyperechoic lines which appear like a barcode or a stratosphere this is barcode or a stratosphere sign and the point of transition in between this is called as a lung point very pathognomic okay very very specific for cases of pneumothorax so to sum up the ultrasound findings of pneumothorax are on a b mode ultrasound you see absent lung sliding absent comet tailing or absent b lines and on an m mode ultrasound you see absent seashore sign instead you will see a stratosphere sign or a barcode sign and also remember that the lung point is a very specific sign of pneumothorax that you can see on an ultrasound the area of transition between lung sliding and absent lung sliding between the seashore sign and the absent seashore sign this area is the transition point the lung point suggestive of pneumothorax now look at this lung ultrasound image and i hope you can see this is the you know rib shadow and you can see the pleural line giving that bat wing appearance and if you observe carefully you can see this area of the lung which is normal which is showing that normal lung sliding and you can also see that vertical comet tailing through it and you can see here this is the area which is not showing any lung sliding and also is not showing those b lines or the vertical comet tailing and you can see that there is an area of you know transition between them if you can evaluate this area of transition what do you call this this is the lung point and this is a very specific point for pneumothorax so another good example to look at seashore sign and the barcode sign and the point of transition which is called as a lung point so between lung sliding and absent lung sliding between seashore sign and the barcode sign the point of transition which is very specific for pneumothorax is called as your lung point and now lastly let's try to understand some important limitations of efast please remember efast is not very reliable in you know evaluating bubble mesenteric or diaphragm injuries it is not you know efficient in evaluating retroperitoneal hematomas please remember retroperitoneal collections they are better evaluated by a ct scan and also keep in mind that when you have some large subcutaneous emphysema especially on the anterior abdominal wall anterior chest wall you will not have proper you know field of view to look at the underlying structures so when you have large subcutaneous emphysema efast may not give you reliable results so please remember these important limitations of efast now let's look at this next question here a patient presented with pain in the right upper quadrant on the fifth post operative day following lap cholecystectomy she is ectoric and on ultrasound there is a collection in the morrison's pouch biliary leak is suspected what is the most sensitive investigation to detect biliary leak is it ercp mrcp hida scan or cct what is the most sensitive investigation to look at biliary leak please remember when you have a cholecystectomy done and you have a collection in that region this could be any post op collection it could be a hematoma there it could be some serous fluid collection there it could be some ascitic fluid it could actually be biliary leak or it could be an abscess there also so we don't know what this collection is on ultrasound so to detect that it is a biliary leak the most sensitive investigation is a hida scan please remember the most sensitive investigation to look at biliary leak is what hida scan but please remember hida is a nuclear scan and nuclear scans have good functional detail but poor anatomical detail so it has poor anatomical detail so it cannot tell you the anatomical site of leak but it can tell you that this collection is a biliary leak but it cannot tell you from where it is leaking so it has poor anatomical detail like with all other nuclear scans these have poor anatomical detail the most accurate investigation to look at the anatomical site of leak 
that is your ERCP. ERCP is the most accurate for detecting anatomical site of leak. Detecting anatomical site of leak. So once you confirm that it is biliary leak, you can go and get an ERCP done to detect the anatomical site of leak and it is not just diagnostic, it is also therapeutic also. Please remember, you can put a stent across the leak also. So ERCP is both diagnostic and therapeutic. It is both diagnostic and therapeutic, but it is invasive, so you want to be pretty sure before you go there. So HIDA scan non-invasively can tell you that the collection there is biliary leak and you can go ahead and get an ERCP done where you can put a stunt across the site of leak. The most accurate to look at the anatomical site of leak is your ERCP. Remember MRCP is basically a heavy T2 weighted image. You get a heavy T2 weighted image. And when you get a T2 weighted image, we all know water is white on T2. World War II, water is white on T2. So all fluids, whether it is any post-op collection, any serous fluid, any ascitic fluid there, or any abscess there, or even a bile there, they all will appear similar on MRCP. So MRCP cannot confirm us that this is a biliary leak. But today we have a newer technique with MRI. If you club a hepatobiliary contrast agent which gets excreted through the hepatobiliary system, if you use a hepatobiliary contrast and do a functional MRI called as MR cholangiography with hepatobiliary contrast, hepatobiliary contrast and take a T1 weighted image. When you are using contrast studies, we generally do a T1 weighted imaging. So when you do a MR cholangiopancreatography with hepatobiliary contrast, then you can see that the MRI will tell you the anatomical site of leak. And because it is a hepatobiliary contrast that you have used, it is also very sensitive for biliary leak because it is coming from the hepatobiliary tree. So it has to be sensitive for biliary leak. So if you want to non-invasively look at the site of leak, and also be sure that this is biliary leak, MR cholangiography with hepatobiliary contrast is a very, you know, good new investigation that we have. Not MRCP, not the traditional MRCP, but MR cholangiography with hepatobiliary contrast. And you need to remember some, what are some important hepatobiliary contrasts that we have. Please remember the important hepatobiliary contrasts that we have are magnafodipir, magnafodipir, trisodium, Remember few names at least. These are hepatobiliary contrasts that we use in MRI. We also have gadolinium EOBDTPA, the gadoxitate, gadoxitate. So these are you know hepatobiliary contrast agents that can be used, and this will give you good anatomical detail and has very good sensitivity comparable to you know ERCP also to look at the anatomical site of date and also confirm you that this is a biliary leak. So MR cholangiography with hepatobiliary contrast is a newer and a better technique which non-invasively tells us where the site of leak and also helps you in you know being sure that this is biliary leak. But do remember most sensitive HEDA scan, most accurate to detect the anatomical site of leak ERCP. The newer technique which non-invasively can help you detect the anatomical site of leak and tell you that it is biliary leak is MR cholangiography with hepatobiliary contrast. Now let's quickly understand HEDA scan. HEDA basically when you have this technetium 99 radioisotope which is you know attached to this ligand HEDA right then this pharmaceutical is taken up by the hepatocytes in the early phases and in the later phases it comes into the biliary tree goes into the gallbladder and reaches the duodenum in the delayed phases. This is how you have a normal HEDA scan. Similar to bilirubin, it is first taken up by hepatocytes and then secreted into the biliary tree and then reaches the you know, gallbladder and the intestine. So this is how you have your normal HEDA scan. Now look at these HEDA scan images in a post cholecystectomy patient. And if you look at the images carefully, I hope you can see that in the initial stages it is in the hepatocytes and in the later part when it comes to the biliary tree, you can also see a collection that is tracking below the left lobe of the liver. So you can see this collection having increased radio tracer activity on the inferior aspect of the left lobe of the liver and this is you know a biliary leak. So this is how I can say that there is definitely a biliary leak because HEDA the radio tracer activity is increasing in it. So this is a biliary leak. This is how HEDA scan helps you in detecting that the collection there is a biliary leak. But can I tell where is the site of leak? 
can I tell whether it is coming from the right hepatic duct or the left hepatic duct, the common bile duct or is it coming from the cystic duct stump, where is this leak coming from, I cannot tell the anatomical site of leak using HEDA scan, it is giving you functional detail but not anatomical detail. And now look at the ERCP image from the same patient, I hope you can see this is the endoscope, so this is the ERCP image and if you observe carefully you can see there is a leak coming from the left hepatic duct. So this tells you that there is an injury to the left hepatic duct and the leak is happening from the left hepatic duct. So to look at the anatomical site of leak, the most accurate investigation is ERCP, it is both diagnostic and therapeutic. Now look at this ERCP image, on this ERCP image you can see that there is a contrast extravasation coming from the common bile duct. So there is an injury and leak happening from the common bile duct. So to most accurately localize the anatomical site of leak, ERCP is better. Now look at these MR images in a patient with post cholecystectomy. One is an MRCP image and another is a MR cholangiography with hepatobiliary contrast. So if you see the MRCP image in a post cholecystectomy patient, I hope you can see that there is a collection noted, right? And this collection, it is not gallbladder. Remember this is post cholecystectomy patient, so it is not gallbladder. There is some collection there and this collection in a post cholecystectomy patient can be any fluid right it can be a ascitic fluid, a serous fluid, a hematoma or it could actually be a bile also. We cannot say that this is bile just like that because all fluids will appear white on MRCP. So MRCP is not very good to you know look at biliary leak. But if you do MR cholangiography with a specific hepatobiliary contrast like magna 4 dipir or you know gadoxitate or gadolinium EOBD TPA. So any of these hepatobiliary contrasts are used and these hepatobiliary contrast will be excreted through the biliary tree and because that contrast is coming into this area of the leak, right? So this is confirming that this leak that is happening here in this post cholecystectomy patient is actually a biliary leak coming from the cystic duct stump. So you can see this leak happening from the cystic duct stump and this collection of the hepatobiliary contrast in that area confirms us that. So that is the reason we said that MR cholangiography with hepatobiliary contrast is a newer and a very very you know good investigation to look at the anatomical site of leak as well as to confirm you that that collection is a biliary leak. So if it is given MRCP that is not useful. If it is given MR cholangiography with hepatobiliary contrast it definitely has very good results non-invasively to look at the anatomical site of leak as well as to confirm you that this is a biliary leak. MR cholangiography with hepatobiliary contrast would definitely be a very good investigation for this. Now look at this next question here. A young male smoker with intermittent pain in the calf has a painful ulcer on the great toe surrounded by blackened skin. What is the best initial investigation that in this case? So what do you think is this case? A young male smoker, intermittent claudication, painful ulcer with blackened skin, this is classic of a non arthromatous condition that is your Berger's disease or thromboangitis obliterans, right? So this is classic for Berger's disease, young male smoker, intermittent claudication, right? So please remember this is a non atherosclerotic condition. So this is a non atherosclerotic condition, you do not have any risk factors for you know atherosclerosis in this patient, no hypertension, no aging. So it's a non-atherosclerotic condition, only smoking is associated but no other atherosclerotic condition is associated. This is Berger's disease, young male smoker having intermittent claudication. And the best initial investigation in this patient is a color Doppler getting a duplex ultrasound done. And what are the findings that you see on imaging in patients with Berger's disease? So in Berger's disease, on angiography, you see this classic corkscrew-like collateral. So when you get angiography done, you see this corkscrew collaterals that you see in patients with Berger's disease, especially involving medium and small size vessels. The large vessels are spayed, the medium and small size vessels, they will be, you know, having this narrowing, having this multiple collaterals cropping out, which show this classic, you know, corkscrew-like areas. And on color Doppler, you can see this snake-like serpiginous vessels. Serpiginous vessels will be there. Serpiginous snake-like vessels areas will be there. And you also see this areas showing this filling and narrowing called as your dot sign, right? So this snake-like appearance and the dot-like areas will be seen showing this areas of normal filling and you know obstruction and narrowing there. So this kind of appearance of a snake sign and dot sign on a color Doppler in a young male smoker showing intermittent claudication should make you think of you know Berger's disease 
and on an angiography you will see the classic corkscrew collaterals. So please remember it affects the you know medium and small size vessels sparing the large inflowing vessels and you see this multiple collaterals cropping out and uh, you can see and here this is a CT angiography image showing you this corkscrew collaterals on a CT angi also you can appreciate this corkscrew collaterals and here this is a digital subtraction angio showing you this corkscrewing right in the upper limb also you can see these corkscrew vessels here right so all of this suggests that this is Burgess disease or thrombinitis obliterans it usually affects the lower limbs bilaterally but can also involve the upper limbs so to sum up in Burgess disease or thromboangitis obliterans on angiography you see this corkscrew collaterals which on color doppler give you that snake or dot like areas and this disease is usually bilateral involves small and medium sized vessels mainly of the lower limb upper limbs can be involved but usually this condition is bilateral and usually involves the lower limbs and uh, it spades the large inflow vessels the large femoral vessels popliteal vessels are spared it usually affects the medium and small sized vessels and this is a non arthromatous disease so when you look at the intimal lining they have smooth intimal lining only they have smooth intimal lining a regular vessel wall will be there right without much you know thickening of the vessel wall so there is a smooth intimal lining and they will not see much calcifications also no calcifications also not like any arthromatous calcification that you see you see no calcifications smooth you know regular vessel wall and no arthromatous you know risk factors would be there only young male with smoker will have this finding this is Burgess disease or thrombangitis obliterans now look at this next question here a year old child presents with anemia hepatosplenomegaly cervical lymphadenopathy and multiple scalp swellings and the skull radiograph is given which of the following drug is commonly used in this scenario so if you look at the skull you see this multiple you know uh, lytic lesions in the skull which have this you know beveled edges there is hole within hole appearance if you look at them very carefully it, it shows beveled edges with hole within hole appearance and this patient who is a one year old child presenting with anemia hepatosplenomegaly cervical lymph nodes and multiple scalp swellings all of these is in favor of Langerhans cell histiocytosis so this is Langerhans cell histiocytosis mainly a littorer swipe disease and uh, what do you use in the treatment so whenever you have a Langerhans cell histiocytosis a letter swipe disease especially in a year old child the treatment consists of giving winblastin and steroids so winblastin and steroids are commonly used in this condition so you had to identify the Langerhans cell histiocytosis by looking at the skull radiograph so what are the important radiographic findings that you see in Langerhans cell histiocytosis you see that these patients have lytic lesion in the skull which have beveled edges right so they have this beveled edges that means that you know the outer table is removed more compared to the inner table giving a hole within a hole appearance so you have this hole within hole appearance so if you see carefully you can see that there is a hole within hole appearance right so you see that hole within hole appearance in cases of Langerhans cell histiocytosis and another important finding is that they have this you know the inner table will appear like a button sequestrum so you have this button sequestrum so if you see very carefully you can see a sclerotic area within this lucency that is called as a button sequestrum also a feature of Langerhans cell histiocytosis or eosinophilic granulomas and another important finding on the skull radiograph these lucencies can coalesce together and produce map like areas these are called as your geographical skull so this is geographical skull where all these you know lytical areas tend to coalesce with each other fuse with each other producing geographical map like areas called as geographical skull and if such lytic areas involve the mandible especially the alveoli of the mandible is involved and then it can give the appearance of floating teeth of the mandible so even floating teeth of mandible can be seen in this patients and in these patients the height of the vertebral bodies is also reduced the vertebral body height can also be reduced very much and it gets very flattened like that and what do you call that this is your vertebra plana vertebra plana is also seen in cases of eosinophilic granulomas or Langerhans cell histiocytosis now look at this question here a 55 year old patient with history of peptic ulcer disease was having abdominal pain and distension since many days it gets worse since the last two hours and you know the blood pressure is 90 by 40 and the radiograph is shown what is to be done in this patient so if you look at the radiograph 
and I hope this is very striking that under the right dome of diaphragm, you can see this free air under the right dome of diaphragm. So this air under diaphragm that you are seeing here, this is suggestive of a hollow viscous perforation on pneumoperitoneum. So this is a case of pneumoperitoneum, known peptic ulcer, right, abdominal pain and stuff. And the clinical history tells you that the patient is in shock, like he is in having hypotension. So the treatment should be to get IV fluids and emergency laparotomy. So the treatment would be what? Giving both IV fluids and getting an emergency laparotomy done. Now look at this next question here. A 45 year old patient with progressive dysphagia to both solids and liquids has a body mass index of 18.5. There is no other systemic illness. Barium swallow is done and shown below. What are the investigations should be done in this patient? So in this patient who is having progressive dysphagia, dysphagia to both solids and liquids, the body mass index tells you that you know the patient is having you know weight loss there and the barium swallow image is shown. So if you look at the barium swallow image carefully, you can see that the lower end of the esophagus shows this smooth tapering which appears like a bird beak. So this is a bird beak appearance. So this is the bird beak appearance on a barium swallow. And this bird beak appearance on a barium swallow is suggestive of what? Achalasia cardia. Achalasia cardia, which is going in favor of a progressive dysphagia to both solids and liquids. And in achalasia also, you may have some weight loss. And what is the other investigation that you would like to do? Obviously, once you have diagnosed it as achalasia, you would like to go for a manometry. And please remember, you should always club it with an upper GI endoscopy to look for any circumferential masses or growths, okay, or to look for any pseudoachalasia that can appear. So it's always important to club it with an upper GI endoscopy. So the other investigations should be upper GI endoscopy and manometry. Now look at this next question here. A young male with head trauma is brought to the emergency in an unconscious state. He is intubated with low Glasgow coma scale. He has no verbal response, no movement on pressure and has features of increased ICT. The non-contrast CT brain and the spinal imagings are normal. What could be the likely diagnosis? Please remember, when you have a young male, young patient with road traffic accident who is having low Glasgow coma scale, right, unconscious patient and if the CT scan is normal, this should make you think of diffuse axonal injury. Diffuse axonal injury, CT scans are usually normal or may show some petechial hemorrhages. Just some petechial hemorrhages may be seen or most of the times they can appear normal also. The investigation of choice for diffuse axonal injury is a MRI. So you should get an MRI done where you will see that there is involvement of the you know corpus callosum, the splenium of corpus callosum, the white matter tracts, the corticospinal tracts will be you know involved. So this is diffuse axonal injury. MRI is the investigation of choice. And to look at this, you know, uh, petechial hemorrhages on MRI, what is the sequence that we will advise? Please remember to look at the petechial hemorrhages, okay, that can occur in diffuse axonal injury patients. You advise a susceptibility weighted imaging or the gradient echo imaging to look for this petechial hemorrhages in patients with diffuse axonal injury. Now, let us look into this next question here. A 25 year old male patient comes to the emergency after a road traffic accident. His respiratory rate is elevated, the blood pressure is also low and he is having difficulty in speaking sentences. On percussion, there is hyperresonant note on the entire right side of the chest. Fast is normal. The chest radiograph is given. What is the next line of management? What is the initial next line of management of this patient? So if you look at the chest radiograph and compare it on the left side, you can see the right side there is absent bronchovascular markings. If you observe carefully, you can also see that there is a visceral pleural line with the lung collapsed towards the hilum. The trachea is shifted to the opposite side and the patient also has, you know, signs of respiratory distress and, you know, there is also circulatory collapse. So for tension pneumothorax, the initial management should be insertion of a large bore needle and followed by an ICD tube. So insertion of a large bone needle in the fifth intercostal space followed by an ICD tube in the fifth intercostal space should be the next step of management. Now look at this next question here. A 40 year old male with progressive forward bending and increasing stiffness of the spine 
a CT spine was performed and is shown below what is the most likely diagnosis. Is it rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, Reiter syndrome or fluorosis? So if you look at the sagittal view of the CT spine and if you observe carefully you can see that there is a calcification of the anterior longitudinal ligament. So in this patient there is calcification of the anterior longitudinal ligament of the spine. And if you look at the mineral density, the bone mineral density, what do you think? Is it, you know, osteosclerosis or osteopenia here? So you can see that these patients are having osteopenia. There is osteopenia. And if you observe carefully, you can also see that there is, you know, a supraspinous ligament calcification, the facet joint ankylosis that is happening. So when you see this supraspinous and also supraspinous ligament calcification, you also have the interspinous ligament calcification, ankylosis of the facet joints, right? All of these go in favor of what? Ankylosing spondylitis. And you can also see the intervertebral disc space, right, is also reduced. The intervertebral disc space is also reduced in ankylosing spondylitis. In fluorosis, you have usually osteosclerosis. In fluorosis, we have osteosclerosis. In fluorosis, you also see there is introsious membrane calcification, introsious membrane calcification. You also see calcification of not just the introsious membrane, you also see sacrotuberous calcification, sacrotuberous ligament between the sacrum and the ischial tuberosity. The sacrotuberous ligament calcification is also a unique finding that you see in fluorosis. So usually it has osteosclerosis. Whereas ankylosing spondylitis has osteopenia, there is calcification of the anterior longitudinal ligament, supraspinous ligament and interspinous ligament calcification and also the facet joint sclerosis, the facet joint ankylosis can be seen in ankylosing spondylitis. Now look at these images of ankylosing spondylitis, the, the findings are better seen here. You can see there is you know calcification of the anterior longitudinal ligament, there is sclerosis of the ends of the intervertebral discs. Right? You can see the intervertebral disc height is also reduced. There is intervertebral disc height which is reduced and look at the bone mineral density, there is osteopenia. And posteriorly, if you can see, there is supraspinous ligament calcification, there is calcification of the interspinous ligament and also you can see there is you know, facet joint ankylosis. So when you are seeing this calcification of anterior longitudinal ligament, sclerosis of the you know, intervertebral disc, periphery of the intervertebral disc, the decrease in the height of the intervertebral disc supraspinous ligament, interspinous ligament calcifications, right? And also you have this facet joint ankylosis, all of them go in favor of what? Ankylosing spondylitis. This is a 3D CT image which is showing this supraspinous ligament calcification. You can also see this anterior ligament calcification. You can see this bridging osteophytes, right? So that you see in ankylosing spondylitis on the MRI also, you can note them, right? So the height of the interval disc is reduced and there is this bridging osteophytes all of these go in favor of ankylosing spondylitis. Now look at this next question here. A 40 year old male with 2 year history of mucopurulent cough underwent a CT chest. What is the most likely diagnosis? So a patient who is having 2 year history of mucopurulent cough and CT chest is showing you the cystic lesions in the left lower lobe. So this grape like cystic area that you are seeing on the left lower lobe in a patient with chronic cough this is suggest you of what? bronchiectasis bronchiectasis so please remember this is a case of cystic bronchiectasis which has this grape like cystic areas so remember bronchiectasis could either be cylindrical where you have this parallel tram track like areas of the bronchi or it could appear beaded like a varicose bronchiectasis or you may have this multiple dilated cystic areas appearing like a bunch of grapes so you may have this cylindrical bronchiectasis giving that you know parallel lines like a tram track or you may have that beaded appearance or you may have this you know bunch of grape like appearance okay a cystic bronchiectasis. So here you can see this is the tram track appearance that you see with cylindrical bronchiectasis. Here you can see there is this beaded appearance of varicose bronchiectasis and here you can see this cystic areas that is suggestive of your cystic bronchiectasis. Now it is important to understand some possible etiologies by looking at the location of the bronchiectasis. Please remember the most common location of bronchiectasis is the lower lobes and is usually idiopathic. It can also occur post-infective. Aspirations also produce lower lobe bronchiectasis and pulmonary fibrosis, the honeycombing and the traction bronchiectasis that occurs in you know interstitial lung disease and pulmonary fibrosis is usually in the lower lobes. 
Upper lobe bronchiectasis is seen with tuberculosis and sarcoidosis. We know that tuberculosis usually affects the upper lobes. Cystic fibrosis and allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, they produce central, that is perihilar, proximal bronchiectasis, as well as, you know, upper lobe bronchiectasis. So, either it can involve the central, perihilar, proximal bronchiectasis or can involve the upper lobes. So, please remember, the allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis and cystic fibrosis and even monier kuhn syndrome, they usually produce central, perihilar, proximal bronchiectasis. So, ABPA and cystic fibrosis as well as monier kuhn syndrome is known to produce this central bronchiectasis. And, you know, middle lobe bronchiectasis, classically involving the middle lobe, this is seen with Mycobacterium avium complex infections. So, MAC infections, they usually produce middle lobe bronchiectasis, again a very important point. Now, look at these CT scan images. In this CT scan images, you can see that this patient has this central perihilar bronchiectasis. And if you look at the size of the bronchi and the size of the trachea, it is very dilated and abnormally dilated. So, when you see such abnormally dilated trachea and the bronchi with central bronchiectasis, which is, you know, having this increase in diameter in inspiration, which is collapsing during expiration. So, when you get this biphasic CT done, during inspiration, there is abnormal dilatation of the trachea and bronchi and there is collapse in the, you know, expiratory phase with bronchiectasis. So, when you have bronchiectasis with abnormal dilatation of the trachea and bronchi, please think of monier kuhn syndrome. So, this is monier kuhn syndrome. And in monier kuhn syndrome, the important investigation is a biphasic CT, a CT performed during inspiration and expiration. During inspiration, it will show the abnormal dilatation of the trachea and the bronchi and during expiration, there is collapse. It is similar to what happens in tracheomalacia. In tracheomalacia, the trachea collapses during expiration. But please remember, the diameter is not very much prominent during inspiration. So, in inspiration, the trachea look okay, but during expiration, they collapse in tracheomalacia. In monier kuhn syndrome, because of the atrophy of the smooth muscles and the connective tissue, there is abnormal dilatation of the trachea and the bronchi, which collapse during the expiration. So, in inspiration, they appear very prominent and they collapse in expiration. This is monier kuhn syndrome. The etiology of monier kuhn syndrome is not clearly understood, right? But today, we consider it to be more of an atrophy rather than a congenital disorder. So, we are consider it to be, you know, atrophy of the, you know, smooth muscles, the elastic fibers rather than a congenital disorder. This is monier kuhn syndrome. And this usually presents in middle-aged males in their fifth decade, you know, exposure to, you know, air pollutants and smoking is said to be one of the associations in these patients. So, here there is another images. So, on the radiographs, you can see the tracheal lucency. On the lateral view also, you can see the tracheal lucency is very much prominent. And you can see this central bronchiectasis. So, whenever you have this bronchiectasis with abnormal dilatation of the trachea and the bronchi, keep, you know, monier kuhn syndrome in your options. And monier kuhn syndrome will show this expiratory collapse of the trachea and the bronchi. And if the tracheal diameter is normal during inspiration and collapses during expiration, Please think of tracheomalacia. Tracheomalacia, you will have this defect in the tracheal cartilages and this will not have this abnormal dilatation in, during inspiration that you see with monier kuhn syndrome. Here, the trachea will appear pretty much normal and collapses during expiration. This is tracheomalacia. And lastly, look at this question here. The radiograph shown below is done for the better assessment of the frontal sinus. What is the common name of this view? So, if you look at the radiograph, skull radiograph, you can see the frontal sinuses very clearly. So, this radiograph that is done to look at the evaluation of the frontal sinus, this is your Caldwell view, which is nothing but an occipitofrontal view. So, let us review the important skull x-ray views. Remember, the Caldwell view, which is the occipitofrontal view, is mainly used for frontal sinus or the superior orbital fissure. So, it is also used for the superior orbital fissure, frontal sinus and the superior orbital fissure, Caldwell view. You can remember like this, right, Caldwell view is for the superior orbital fissure and the frontal sinus. Waters view, which is occipitomental view, this is for maxillary sinus. We all know that to evaluate the maxillary sinus and also to look at the orbital floor. Remember orbital floor fractures where the contents hang into the maxillary sinus, the teardrop fracture, the blowout fracture, the contents hang into the maxillary sinus. So, to look at the orbital floor and to look at the maxillary sinus, the preferred x-ray view is your water's view, which is nothing but a occipitomental view. And please remember, if you have a occipitomental view with open mouth, this is called as Perry's view. So, if you have a occipitomental view with open mouth 
Along with the maxillary sinus, you can also look at the sphenoid sinuses. So, if you have a peris view done along with the maxillary sinus, you can also look at the sphenoid sinus through the open mouth. So, peris view is occipitomental with open mouth and waters view is just an occipitomental with closed mouth. And what is Reese view used for? Please remember, Reese view is mainly used to look at the optic canal. To look at the optic canal, right? And to also evaluate the ethmoidal sinuses, we can use this Reese view. So, Reese view is to look at the optic canal and the ethmoidal sinuses. The base skull view, which is also called as submento vertical view, is better to look at the sphenoid sinus. To look at the sphenoid sinus, we use this base skull view, also called as submento vertical view. And please remember, if you want to look at all the paranasal sinus in a single view, you have to use a lateral skull x-ray. So, in a lateral skull x-ray, you can see all the sinuses in a single view and you can also evaluate the cella also, right? To look at the cella and to look at all the sinuses in a single radiograph, you can go for a lateral view. So, this is a Caldwell view, which is an occipitofrontal view. So, you can see this is the occipitofrontal view and this will show you the frontal sinuses better. And this is the waters view or occipitomental view. So, from the occiput towards the mentum with a closed mouth, if you take an radiograph that is called as a waters view and is used to look at the maxillary sinuses better and also evaluates the orbital floor. And what is a town's view? Please remember, town's view is basically an angulated anteroposterior view. So, it is an angulated anteroposterior view of skull. So, you have an angulated anteroposterior view of the skull and you can see the opening of the foramen magnum in this and under the shadow of the foramen magnum, you can see the cella, the dorsum cella, the posterior clinoid process and you can also note the petrous ridge there. So, if you want to evaluate the foramen magnum, the dorsum cella, the posterior clinoid process and the petrous ridges, you can use this town's view. It is basically an anteroposterior view of the skull with a 30 degree angulation. So, that completes the discussion of the radiology questions that were asked in INICT November 2020. The purpose was to just get you familiar with the techniques that were asked like the DEXA scan and the you know quantitative CT which you may not have studied well and also to get you a clear idea between what are the you know normal lung ultrasound findings and what are the findings on lung ultrasound in cases of pneumothorax. I hope this discussion will help you for your preparation. Thank you so much.